and have some fun on the phone with you this morning if you want to call in and we are keeping you company here on Seaside FM. Seaside FM. Seaside FM has been serving the Eastern Passage community and Nova Scotia since 2001. But without Wayne Harrod's dream of being in radio and his drive to overcome a birth defect that left him with a speech impediment, Seaside FM would never have made it onto the air. So we'll continue with the music and information that you need right here on Seaside FM. This is the story of Wayne Harrod's journey from an inspired radio listener to the general manager and program director of 105.9 Seaside FM, one of the great success stories of community radio in Atlantic Canada. But to tell Wayne's story, we have to start at the beginning. Hi, Lionel Richie from the Commodores. We'll hear from him in a bit. Black and Decker makes power tools. We've only just begun. The year is 1976. Tuning into the radio in Halifax, you hear the big voices of Brian Phillips, Terry Williams, and Bill Taylor. For the Times, this is what's expected from radio announcers. Low, bassy voices dominated the airwaves, bringing listeners their news and music. Listening at home, 15-year-old Wayne Harrett sees the world of radio opening up before him. Yes, I did want to be a broadcast. And uh, uh, ever since I was a young person, sit and listen to the radio announcers on the AM radio side of life. I used to listen to them and thought, that, that was pretty neat. They get to play all that music. They're uh, out in, with the community, talking with the listeners. But for Wayne, it seemed a lofty goal. He knew he might not ever fit in to the boss style of radio. Back in those uh, golden days of AM radio, yes, you really needed a good, what they used to call boss radio jock voices, really deep. And we have some, we had some super box radio uh, radio announcers around here. I'm thinking Barry Phillips, uh, the late great Randy Dewar was one, Terry Williams. Gail Rice was in the industry at the time, and she agrees. Because I had been the program director of CFDR Radio for seven years, so I was in the business of hiring announcers. So I, you know, I listened to a lot of audition tapes, and we were always looking for a certain sound, as you know, that, that radio voice. But Wayne did not have that radio voice. He was born with a congenital disorder. Born with a cleft palate. Actually, I'm one of the better ones. There's a lot of people that are worse off with a cleft palate. That, that's when the roof of your mouth has to be surgically closed. The cleft palate gave Wayne difficulty with his speech development. In my younger days, I had to do some speech there. I remember I, I had a TV show that, not me, I mean, I used to watch a TV show called Emergency. I had a hard time saying that word. I remember, yeah, I remember the... Uh, Instructor told me how to say it and whatever, and then it was pretty neat. And that would continue into junior high school. Wayne's friends in the radio industry now, like New Cap Radio's J.C. Douglas, don't know what it was like to deal with a speech impediment, but they do recognize the challenges he's faced getting into the radio business. It might have been the first time I talked to him, he said, uh, yeah, I, I always wanted to be in radio, but couldn't because of my cleft palate. So it was just like kind of an accepted thing. And I didn't challenge him on that because, yeah, it would have been difficult for someone like him to get into private radio with, with a, you know, an impediment of that sort. Well, because I knew my limits in radio because there was no uh, uh, avenue for me to go into commercial radio to be on, on air because of my voice. I know they wouldn't take me and there was limits and I knew the limits of uh, radio. Still loved the business and industry, but Unfortunately, I wasn't given the, uh, the gift to continue on into the commercial side of things. But Wayne's voice did not deter him from getting involved in the radio industry. After a short time with Channel 10 in Dartmouth, Wayne spent six years volunteering with CKDU, the only alternative to commercial radio at the time. You're listening to CKDU 88.1 FM in Halifax. And I did everything over there. So I was a producer of a comedy show. I was a writer up the news. I did audio tech and uh, some feelings. Not many feelings, but at least I was getting the experience of radio. Wayne also started a newsletter called On the Air in Halifax. 
That newsletter became a website and soon grew into On the Air in Atlantic Canada. One of the connections he made through On the Air brought him a curious proposal. And one guy got a hold of me. His name was Steve Buffett. And he was an engineer at that time at the CJCH C100. So he came over, we got big friends. And then he said, uh, how about set up a little radio uh, in your house, just a little antenna. So we went into a small room, set up a little transmitters, what, what, maybe, maybe even less than that. And was picking up on my kitchen radio. I thought that was cool. I just walked from one room and look, it's on my video. <laughs> I thought, I'm a happy man. <laughs> But the experiments didn't stop there. Then we decided to put the antenna, attach it to a frying pan, a metal <laughs> frying pan, onto the roof of the house, and put a CB antenna, this kind of antenna up there, and then we were going around the neighborhood. You know, people started hearing it. Soon, Wayne decided he'd have to have a reason to broadcast. Through Lee Smith at CKVN in Edmonton, he learned about special events radio. So I decided, let's try the uh, Eastern Passage Cal Bay Summer Carnival Days. I think the line that really made change in mind was, we can be your loudspeaker for your community in events. And even though he had his doubts, Wayne's friend J.C. Douglas remembers how it all got started. Went out to see him in his mobile home out in Eastern Passage and... Uh, you know, it was a sparse kind of setup, but it was uh, it was better than I expected to see. Uh, but he was ready to go, and he had the mixer, and he had uh, you know turntable and cassette deck and and CD player and stuff, and he and he was all set up. So uh, I was pretty impressed the first time I went out to uh, to see it. Having the technical capability to broadcast was one thing, and a reason to broadcast another. But Wayne was still nervous about being on the air himself. Gail Rice remembers Wayne's worries, and he asked me. So do you think that, that they'll accept me? And, and I, if, my first thought would have been no, but then after I, I got to, to talk to him for a little bit, got to know him, I thought, of course. And uh, we had fun for two weeks. And then, then we went off the air after the carnival was over, went back on at Christmas time for Christmas from the Passage. We play all Christmas music. And then uh, we started going into the easy listening format. And people really started liking that. And that's when the community became a market. We have uh, petitions handed in to us saying we want you on full time. And what people wanted was the easy listening because it wasn't being served in this market at that time. So we put together an application, got my uh, radio friends together, got people from the community, former board of directors, and uh, became Seaside Broadcasting Organization. 94.7 Seaside FM took to the airwaves for the first time on August 2nd, 2001. And the very first song I played at 9.47 that morning was The Carpenters, We Have Only Just Begun. Since then, Wayne has been program director and general manager for the station. He also hosts The Rolling Home Show weekday afternoons. His voice is unique on the airwaves, and while the station was growing, Wayne still faced challenges because of his voice. I do remember one person that called up, and it was a lady, and uh, she said, Are you for real? She thought I was acting with my voice. I went, No. <laughs> and so uh, uh, I thought she was being a bully. For as many people that doubt him, there are even more people that believe Wayne is right where he should be. Fellow on-air personality, Krista Cook, has known Wayne since before Seaside FM. Wayne has not stopped at anything. He, if people have doubted him, he has just left them with, oh my gosh, I should not have doubted him. Good morning, Seaside FM. Hello, this is Shirley again. Yes, Shirley again. I thought you had a different name, not Shirley again. <laughs> <laughs> That's... People have told me too that I'm not phony, as I am what I am, and that's, uh, you know, that's, I like that. Wayne Herrett has left his mark on the community that surrounds him. Seaside FM is seen as a great success and a great example of what can be done with community radio. And Wayne's dedication to Seaside FM is admired by HRM counselor Jackie Barkhouse. 
Wayne is so important as a role model. Um, he's able to show that uh, you don't have to be like everybody else to be successful. And um, there again, you know, Wayne has broken the mold. And he has also left his mark on those in commercial radio. His longtime friend J.C. Douglas is now the program director for New Cap Radio in Halifax. Wayne Herrett is my hero. What he's built there has been astonishing, and he's never let anything, any uh, things that other people would see as impediments, stand in his way. He's done what he's needed to do to get on the air and to, you know, to take care of his community from a media standpoint. And I absolutely admire him for it, and he is my hero. And just as he was inspired by the radio voices when he was growing up, Wayne inspires the future generation of the radio industry. And when it comes to seeing what he can do after reaching past the limits of his voice, Wayne Herrett has only just begun. And yes, we've just begun. The Carpenters on Seaside FM at 4.15. Good afternoon. It's Friday and time to roll into your weekend with more non-stop music on Seaside FM. This profile written and produced by Paige Fawcett and John McIver, students in the Radio and Television Arts Program at the Nova Scotia Community College.